un match de, 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 de week-end avec nous, euh, et, 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 et Brian McCormick, qui nous vient euh, du sud de la frontière. Uh, Brian uh, actually asked me not to read any uh, profile and uh, just to say read his name. A quick story though, uh, I would say that I'm actually very happy to have him here. Just this week I was reading about this last blog post about soccer players um, who were actually very skilled technically but were not um, taught or well developed properly. So he really, he really has a deep knowledge of how to develop, develop players really beyond even knowing the technicals or tacticals of the sport. So I really look forward to hearing more about that and I hope uh, you'll enjoy it. So without any more um, waiting, very for me. First thing, I'm going to try to stay somewhat close to how the talks are described in the schedule for the weekend. Um, but since we were in here already, I figured I'll try to do most of my lecturing while we're here. And then once we get on the court, we can spend most of the time actually doing stuff. Instead of trying to talk to you a lot out there. Uh, so for some of you, this might be boring stuff. For some of you, it might be the interesting stuff. I don't know. Uh, but I'll try to do most of the long talking uh, while we're here in the classroom. I'll do my best to finish by, uh, by 12.30 because I'm hungry too, so uh, uh, I'll be happy to finish around 12.30 so we can, so we can eat. Uh, so whenever I work with groups, uh, whether my own team or when I go and do clinics with players, the first thing uh, that I do is I, is I give players two rules. Okay, and so uh, one, which won't really um, mean anything right now, but if I tell you to go somewhere, run. And then two, if you have a question, ask. Okay, I, I'm not going to be speaking any French this weekend, sorry. Uh, I don't speak a lot of French. Uh, so I don't know what you guys know, first of all. Uh, two, I don't know how much is lost in translation. Uh, three, uh, you know, I mean, even within the states, you know, people use different terms for the same thing. Uh, you know, so I might be saying something that you actually know, but you just use a different word for it uh, within English, not to mention the French. So, uh, point being, if you have a question about anything, whether it's in here or out there, whatever, players, coaches, whoever, uh, ask. Uh, that's the only way that I can clarify. I guarantee you that if you don't understand something, there's somebody else in here that doesn't, uh, excuse me, doesn't understand that well. Okay, so uh, please feel free, ask questions, interject as needed. Uh, I'll do my best to re-explain or, you know, I'll make sure you can have a little translate for me. Uh, that's first. Uh, so, just to give me an idea, all right, you guys all coach same age groups, different age groups, all of the above. Like what, are we, what are we talking about here in terms of who do we coach, generally speaking? Anybody wants to go first? Yes. Uh, 15 to 17. 15 to 17. So is that one team? Yeah. Okay. Boys, girls, both? Boys. Okay. Anybody else? Different? Same? Yeah. What do we got? 14 to 18? 14 to 16? 14, 15, 16. 14, 15. 12. So we got 12. 14, 16. <coughs> Anything else? Anything <coughs> significantly different? Younger, older? Yes, no? So, uh, so most of our teams we're saying are adolescents, basically. Mm -hmm. All right? Uh, I'm assuming we have boys and girls in here. Uh, are these quote unquote competitive teams, development teams, community teams, school teams, all of the above? Yes? All the what, level say developed teams. Level city developed teams. teams. Okay, so but they're mostly through schools, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alright. Uh, right. so next question. Again, before I really get started. Um, some of you are forced to be here, some of you aren't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but when you showed up today, uh, what kinds of things are you guys 
hoping to learn or get out of this weekend? Yes. Uh, more skills. More like, skills. Uh, more, more skills for yourself or? Uh, for, for, um, for the team actually, for, for any individually or in, as a team. So how to teach skills? Of teaching. Autonomy with players. System versus system. Transferring the skill of learning the court of the court settings. Two things, all right. So, the first two things that I tried to do a little bit here, uh, talk to you guys, is number one, okay, set expectations, all right. So that's the idea of, you know, when I tell players, you know, my my first two rules, run, ask questions, okay. So I want to set the expectations. I think that's one of the uh, biggest keys, really, in coaching. Uh, whenever I go for interviews for jobs, the always the most popular question is always, you know, what rules do you have or how do you deal with discipline problems and all these things? And I never have a good answer because I never really have problems. Okay, and part of that is product of who I coach and the environments that I've coached in. I've been pretty fortunate that I've never really uh, coached in a quote unquote bad environment. Um, you know, uh, most. I mean, I think all the all the players that I've ever coached in any country. Uh, you know, I mean, they well, they're generally good kids. Uh, so I haven't had a ton of difficulties that way, uh, you know, for the most part. Uh, and so it's, 
it's not something that when I think of coaching that I think about as a problem. Okay, whereas I think administrators, that's all they think about is the problems that they've had with other coaches or other athletes or whatever. So, uh, but when I go back to it, is I think one of the reasons that I don't have those problems is because of the expectations that I set at the beginning of the season, uh, at the beginning of tryouts, at the beginning of practice, etc. Uh, just putting, getting them to understand where I'm coming from. Uh, and then the second part of that, the second thing that I tried to do, okay, is to empower players. Uh, so I want to get players involved in uh, the running of the team, the decision making, uh, and give them some ownership of the team. Uh, one of the big uh, kind of differentiators between players who ultimately are very successful and those that don't quite make it uh, is the ones that are very successful are the elite performers take ownership of their own training, of their own development, uh, basically of themselves. Uh, you know, whereas other players will tend to look to somebody to do everything for them, all the organizing, uh, you know, uh, you know, they'll be the ones that will tend to come up with excuses why they can't do something, whereas the ones that ultimately are the most successful take ownership of themselves and, and they make things happen, whether it's, you know, you know, finding a ride to practice instead of just saying they can't go because they don't have a ride or uh, staying after school or to shoot more or, you know, asking the coach to open the gym for them in the morning before school, whatever the case is, the players that ultimately go the farthest take ownership for themselves. So one of the things that I try to do as a coach is I want to empower players because I want them to start to take ownership not just of themselves but also of the team. Okay, so I want to know what you guys want to learn. I don't want to just stand up here and talk, you know, based on what I think is best or whatever I decided I wanted to talk about while sitting at home, all right? Uh, so to me, that's important, and I think that helps you get buy-in with your team, uh, and it helps to motivate the team, all right? Uh, and so another thing in terms of rules, like I said, I don't create my team rules. Uh, I allow players to come up with our team rules. So, you know, how are we gonna address different things? What's gonna happen? What, what do you guys want our punishment to be if somebody's late for practice? You know, is being late for practice because you were at school, is that something that we're gonna punish or is that acceptable? Is being late because you don't have a ride? If you miss a practice, what should happen? Should you miss the next game? Should you miss a quarter of the next game? What do you guys want the punishment to be? Uh, and so to me, I think that helps again, it's, it's buy-in. And so players, uh, and you know, coming from more of an adult environment, uh, you know, I think, you know, with college players especially, we do this. And it's, uh, if players make the rules, they don't feel like they're trying to get over on the coach. If they're breaking the rule, they're letting down each other. And that's a more impactful uh, consequence than a coach getting mad at somebody. All right, so uh, in my experience or my opinion, if you just hand out a list of rules to a team, you try to find ways to get around the rules. Uh, whereas if it's players all coming together and saying, all right, this is what we want for our team. This is what our team culture is going to be. Okay, this is what we want to achieve this season as a team. And to achieve that, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, then there's a lot more buy-in, and it's everybody together, as opposed to, you know, kind of a, well, the coach wants this, ah, oh, we don't really need to do that, we can try to get by, you know, nobody tell the coach, those kind of things. So, uh, that's just a way of, I guess, getting started uh, in terms of kind of overlooking the season and what you're going to do and what you're going to put in. Uh, so, in terms of actual practice planning, that's what the original talk of this segment is supposed to be. Uh, first off, there's two ways to think about practice. All right, so uh, within a season, and again, it's going to depend on your schedule. So uh, a high school team in the United States typically plays two games a week, uh, so you have three practices. Some, some will practice on Saturday. They'll give you four practices. But generally speaking, most teams will practice three times a week play twice a week. And those schedules might be game schedule Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, it just depends. Uh, but there's two ways to structure a practice. One is thinking about practice in terms of acquisition and one in terms of recovery. So 
An acquisition practice is a time where you are going to uh, really be teaching things, teaching new things. It's typically when your players are going to be uh, more fresh. Okay, so Mondays. So if I have a Wednesday, Friday schedule, okay, I don't want my Thursday practice to be when I'm trying to put in a bunch of new stuff. Okay, if we play the day before, we're playing the next day, you know, that's not really the time where I want to, you know, try to teach a new skill or develop something, something that's never been, um, you know, introduced before. So that Thursday practice, that's going to be more of a recovery practice. So recovery practice is where we're going over things that have already been introduced. Okay, so in an acquisition practice, okay, your cognitive load is going to be much higher. Okay, there's a lot more thinking involved. Okay, in a recovery practice, the cognitive load is going to be a lot less because it's stuff that you've already done or at least introduced before. Okay, so again, whether it's a new play, a new skill, a new drill, okay, you want to introduce those things in your acquisition practices and not a recovery practice. All right, so that's the first thing. So within a week then you can look at each practice slightly differently, okay? As opposed to trying to plan every practice exactly the same. Okay, we're gonna do this, 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 this. It's different depending on what, what point in the season you are, or what point in the week you are, how many games you have, et cetera, et cetera. All those things are going to impact how you plan a practice, okay? Additionally, when you, excuse me, when you plan a practice, you have to account for factors such as how many assistant coaches you have, how many players you have, how many balls you have, how many baskets you have. Uh, all those things will impact how you ultimately plan the practice, what you're going to do at practice. All right? uh, and so every practice is going to be different. Okay? And, and the next part of that is you have to understand your team and your team's, you know, the constraints around your team. So, uh, so when I coached in Europe, I had uh, our Thursday night practices. I had three players who drove over an hour to get to practice. And they were all adults. They all had jobs. Uh, two of the three were also in school, et cetera, et cetera. So they didn't come to our Thursday practices. All right? So that meant I knew, you know, Thursday night I wasn't going to have two starters and my other they actually happen to all three be post players. So my three post players essentially weren't coming to practice on Thursday nights. So I had to adjust my weekly plan knowing that Thursdays we're not going to have any post players. You know? So that means I did things differently earlier in the week knowing that Thursday is basically going to be a guard workout, not a real team practice. Okay? And so within your team, you know, you learn things like that. Some kids have to work, you know, some might have other extracurriculars that they do, playing another sport, you know, uh, playing in a band, whatever the case may be. Uh, and so that's another thing that you have to take into account, not only planning an individual practice, but then thinking about your weekly practice plan and even a seasonal plan, okay? Because if, you know, let's say, you miss two players having this practice on Tuesdays because they work on Tuesday, you know, you don't want to introduce a bunch of new stuff on a Tuesday practice because then you're going to end up having to re-explain it all the next day when they come back. Uh, so if everybody's there on a Monday, you want to spend the Monday practice trying to introduce as much new stuff as possible, and then you can use Tuesday, you know, kind of as a review for the players that are there, and that way, you know, the players who are missing don't miss too much new information. Does that make sense? Okay? So all these things go into how you're ultimately going to plan a practice. All right? uh, and then the next part before I kind of start drawing stuff. Uh, one thing I use, um, and it kind of uh, uh, goes with what Chantel was saying about teaching players how to win. Uh, I use what's called the competitive policy. Uh, I got it from Anson Dorrance, I believe who's the women's soccer coach at University of North Carolina. Uh, I believe he got it from Dean Smith, the former basketball coach at the University of North Carolina. Essentially, so when I write up my practice plan, uh, so I write up and I put, uh, first of all, I use an index card every single day and I write out what I'm going to do on that day. So I have players X, Y, and Z all the way down, and then I write out 
along here, I'll put the drills that I'm going to do for the day. Okay, so let's say we have one verse one, two verse two, three verse three, etc. So when we do those drills, keep score and we keep track of winners. So if you know X wins this one, then get a one here, two on two, you know these two win, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that at the end of the day, I have my total. Okay, and whoever wins, so whoever that player is, um, at the end of practice, I do like a token kind of conditioning. Okay, and so whoever wins through the day doesn't have to do the conditioning. That's their reward. All right. Uh, I have found, without exception, girls, teams, everybody still does the conditioning. Boys, teams, they do not do the conditioning. They sit there and talk trash to all the girls or all the other players who are doing the conditioning. That is one major difference I've found between coaching girls and coaching boys. Uh, without exception. Every team that I've done this with, every girls team, they all do it. I've even had times where I've forced them not to do it because they were borderline injured. I said, no, you're not doing extra conditioning. Boys teams, they will not do it ever with each other. <laughs> talk trash and make fun of all the ones who are. Uh, and then the next thing that I do, which most people don't like this part of, but when I've coached high school teams with this, uh, and sub varsity, uh, so freshman teams, JV teams, um, where to me it's a truly developmental level, and, and winning is second or third, not really that important, but the point is to develop players for the varsity team. Uh, I determine my starters uh, based on this. Okay, so, uh, you know, let's say this is our total for the day. So, when I write up, when I write up today's plan, okay, I list them in order. Okay, and the order is based on where they've been up to that point in the season. So let's say, you know, we're two weeks into the season, you know, he's got 22 wins, 21, 18, 10, etc. All the way down. All right? So we finish out, you know, everybody has a total for today. So then I add up, and so now they're at 23, whatever, whatever, whatever. And if tomorrow is a game, I just look down and see. Look at this number, all right, who are the top five? One, two, three, five, all right, you guys are my five starters. All right, whoever's number one, you're my captain for that game. So my captain changes every game, my starters change every game. Again, it's not the best strategy to use to win uh, because it definitely hurts continuity uh, because players are constantly playing with different players. I've started games with, you know, three post players and I run a pretty guard-oriented offense. Uh, I've started games with three point guards in the game at the same time. So uh, it's not what I would do if my number one objective was to win. Okay, when I coached in Europe and I had a quote unquote professional team, I did not do this. Okay, we had the same starting lineup every single game. All right? Uh, but at a developmental level, uh, I think it helps with a couple things. One, the biggest problem. Maybe that's a big one. But in general, I would say the biggest problem that players have with their coaches is they don't think that they're treated fairly. Or they don't think that they have a fair chance. So they go into the season, you know, player ends up, all right, I'm not a starter. You know, I feel like I'm out playing the starter in practice, but I don't, nothing changes. You know, I still get my 10 minutes a game. You know, he still gets his 20 minutes a game. And it doesn't matter what happens in practice. Doesn't matter what happens in games, nothing changes. Okay? And I hear that all the time from parents, I hear that all the time from players, and it seems to be, besides uh, coaches who coach their own kid and favor their own kid, it seems to be the most consistent complaint of people, especially obviously the non starters. If you're the person that's benefiting from that, you tend not to complain about it. All right? But using this takes care of that. Because two things. One, uh, it's on them, right? I mean, I'm not deciding who the starters are, right? It's, it, uh, there is no subjectivity whatsoever, you know? I mean, everybody always says, you know, I, as a coach, you know, coaches say, well, I don't pick the starters, you pick the starters by your play. But it's not true. I mean, ultimately, the coach is saying, no, I'm starting you, you, and you. 
because I perceive that you're the best five players, or you're the five players that are going to play the best. It doesn't mean that that's true. It's what it's just my perceptions. Okay, and so everything we see, we see through our own eyes. Okay, uh, and that's one of the one of the things that tends to become a problem for coaches is. Uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy. So I, I decide early in the season that Johnny's my best point guard. So anything Johnny does well just reaffirms that opinion. And then when Johnny does something poorly, then I just kind of overlook it because it's an abnormality. Well, I know he's already good. He's, he just made a mistake. Whereas when I see you know Jimmy and I decide Jimmy's not very good, then every time he makes a mistake, it's like, see, he's not very good. And every time he makes a, makes a good play, I just kind of overlook him. I see this every single week. I rep soccer, um, and so I live in a very small town, so I basically do one high school team's games every single week. And there are two kids on this team, and the coaches yell at these two kids every single week. And Seth is a defensive midfielder, and he is a very good player. But he is not a popular kid. And he gets yelled at all the time. And Ali is obviously not a soccer player. And he's kind of a goofball, a little bit of an airhead, really nice kid. And they put him in goal because he uh, knocked the kid over when he was a fullback and got called for a penalty kick and he lost the game. So they just made him a goalie. And every time <coughs> the ball goes in the goal, he gets yelled at. It doesn't matter what anybody else on the field is. They let a guy dribble through all the way and get five feet from him to shoot on goal, and they're yelling at him that he doesn't stop the ball. I'm like, he literally just dribbled through 10 other people, and you're yelling at the goalie because he can't stop a you know, one on up. Like, and it's because, part of it is because the two coaches, their kids are the two best, and they always miss shots, and they never get yelled at. And so, I see it every week, and it is definitely the self-fulfilling prophecy. They decided at the beginning of the year that this kid, Seth, wasn't that good, and he really is pretty good for that team. I mean, nobody on the team is really that good, but for that team, he's pretty good. And, but he constantly gets yelled at, and I just find it frustrating when I'm referring the game. I'm like, come on. like your, your son was literally standing this far from the goal and kicked it over the goal. And you don't say a word to him. And, you know, Seth misses one ball in midfield, and it's like the world ends. So, anyway, point being, it happens. Okay? And so this is one way I have found to try to get rid of that problem as a coach. Because, I, you know, I think I'm a decent coach. But at the high school level, like, I coached a freshman for two years. I couldn't tell you who the best kid on that team was. Like, one day it was one kid, another day it was another kid. Like, you know, they were up and down. They're freshmen, you know? They make mistakes. Sometimes, you know, they, one kid would come out and score 20 points. The next day he couldn't make a shot. Like, it happens, you know? And they were all very equal. And trying to pick who the five best were, like, it was, I could have flipped the point. Like, they're all pretty much the same. And so if I had designated you know, okay, these are going to be my top seven, and I'm going to play you, you know, 30 minutes a game, you know, 20, 30 minutes a game, and these are everybody else, and you're just going to get kind of minutes when I can find time for you. Then, yes, these seven players would have improved, and we probably would have been a better team, regardless of which seven I picked, you know, because they're all pretty much starting out at equal, right? So if I just pick seven, and I, I focus all my energy, all my playing time, all my coaching, all my practice reps, et cetera, et cetera, these seven, we would have been a better team, and these seven probably would have improved, and these seven probably wouldn't have. Okay, certainly not to the same extent. <coughs> okay, but yeah. You keep the win word for the record for you, or you show it to the player? I show it. Do you ever play it? I do. Okay. Yep, they come over, like especially the games tomorrow. I'm like adding up, you know, on my little index card. I mean, because I'm going to. By the time we get to mid-season, I mean, we've got like 100 points and stuff, so I'm like 100. And then, you know, and so I'm adding it up. And then, who's starting tomorrow? Who's starting tomorrow? Who's starting, how many points do I have? Who's starting tomorrow? Here. Do you see trash talk? What? Do you see trash talk? Do you guys do the norm? Uh, not, not from a, a length perspective. The, the trash talk is pretty much only a daily thing. So if I win today, I'm talking trash to you. I don't see, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm the first guy talking trash to the bench players, 
Um, and the, I should I should mention the other part of it is I also I did play everything. Okay, so um, regardless of, of whether or not you're starting, you're gonna play. I played every player, just about every half of every game. But every player played every game, unless they were punished for something else. Well, that, that was my question. Is any behaviors make you lose points? Anything you don't want to see? Yeah. Yeah. No, I base it strictly on wins. Okay. Uh, the only the only exception was you know like one year we had a kid who left at Christmas and went to Hawaii for three weeks, so he missed like ten practices. So, in all honesty, I didn't punish him. He had to sit out. He sat out the first game. He was back, but up until that point, he had started every game. He was number one on the list every single day, uh, or at the end of every practice, and he never started again the rest of the season because he lost the chance to get so many points. So that is one positive and negative of it. Uh, and so one thing that I know uh, a coach that I just talked to that bought my book and is using this idea, uh, he's gone to, um, he actually created a spreadsheet that does it automatically where he's only gonna count the last 10 practices. So if you, know, if you miss a couple early in the season and you're way at the bottom, eventually those practices go away and as we go along in the season, you, you do still have a chance to recover and get out of the time, as opposed to just getting buried. And then, because there was one, I had one player, and it wasn't a big deal because he didn't care, he really didn't care that much, but uh, his aunt and uncle got murdered in the middle of the season. And so he missed like a week, two weeks of practice because of it, uh, which to me wasn't really fair that he was never going to have the chance to start because of that happening, but um, he was never really mentally into the season up to that point anyway, so it wasn't a big concern uh, from that perspective, but that was that was something that got me rethinking, all right, well, how can we come up with a different way to do this so that a situation like that doesn't handicap a player for the entire season. So, again, it's just an idea to use. There's different ways to play around with it. Uh, I'm not saying it's the perfect way to do anything, but I do think it does continue to motivate players. Uh, you know, within a season, because they always know, well, you know, if I have a couple of good practices, I can start. Uh, as opposed to, nope, these are my five starters, and nothing's ever going to change that. Um, so for some players, that's motivating. Uh, some players, it's less motivating. Uh, but I think it does help. I think the combination of that plus playing everybody really helped uh, all the teams I've done with it. You can see that every player on the team really improved. You know, when I did it with a girls team, uh, we would play teams and, you know, games would be fairly even with our starters. And then we'd start going to our bench and they'd start going to their bench and we would just destroy teams. Because I might have players on my bench who are as good or better than my starters just because of, you know, maybe they missed a practice and they're, so they fell behind or something. Um, whereas other teams that pretty much only played five players for the majority of the time and only you know, their sixth up and eighth player only played occasionally, they would come in and they just weren't as good. And so, you know, my second team would just destroy these other second teams essentially. Or we just wear out their starters if they tried to play their starters the whole time. So I had 12 equal players and, you know, playing against their five, we just wear them down. Uh, so that's where I really saw it in terms of improvement is, is my players that I would say at the, at the beginning of the year uh, started at the bottom they really improved a lot more than they would have if I had not done something like this or I had not played everybody, uh, you know, and they didn't get as much playing time, they didn't get as many reps, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so anyway, just an idea, just something to think about. But again, that's kind of how I write out my practice, um, you know. So one thing I will say, uh, there are two ways kind of to look at a practice plan. You can look at a practice plan as uh, basically procedures to follow, or you can look at it as a rough guide. Okay? So when I first started coaching years ago, okay, I wrote out every single minute of a practice. Okay, so we are going to warm up for the first seven minutes. After that, we're gonna do this for three minutes, then we're gonna do this for two minutes, then we're gonna take a water break for one minute, and then we're gonna do this for ten minutes, etc. 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 Okay, so the entire practice was written out minute by minute. Um, every single, everything that I was going to do uh, in that practice was listed out. 
Okay, so drill one, drill two, free throws, water break, drill three, drill four, drill five, scrimmage, blah, blah, blah. Okay? I don't do that anymore. All right? I do advise new coaches, beginning coaches, young coaches, unconfident coaches to do it that way, more or less. Okay? It doesn't have to be exactly minute by minute, but you should have the time written out. Okay? When I coach now, I don't because of two reasons. One, I know how long, generally I know how long a drill is going to take. Okay, so if I put three on three wildcat rules in for practice, okay, I know I need eight to 12 minutes to do that. Okay, uh, and I'll probably get two games out of this. Okay, I know that's what's going to happen. And if something goes wrong, and let's say we finish, you know, real quick, I know other drills that I can substitute in to either build on that or subtract them. Okay, so that's the reason why I don't play a minute by minute right now, um, is because I like to see what's going on in practice and adjust based on that. So when I write out a practice now, uh, generally speaking, I have six or seven activities that I want to do in a practice. Okay, so. Uh, the first thing I do in all my practice, we do a dynamic warm up. I'll go more into that once we get on the court. Okay, so I just write out dynamic warm up, and then I might add, you know, if I want to, if I really want to concentrate on something, okay, today, or I want to make sure that I remember to do. Uh, so I have a lot of exercises that I can use in my warm up, and sometimes I forget them or I don't do them all. So if there's something specific from yesterday or whatever that I want to make sure that we do, I'll write it down. Okay, so I want to make sure that we do, you know, lateral skip today or whatever. All right, so I always end my warm up with a funish, what I consider a fun activity. So that was one of our things that we needed to talk about today. So to me, uh, I play tag, and when we play tag, it's a ball handling drill. Uh, and so typically, with most teams I work with now, I play what I call team tag. Again, I'll show that once we get on the court. Okay, so I write out team tag. So that's, that's pretty much my warm up to me. Okay, so once we finish the team tag, we're basically kind of warm up. All right, so then I'm gonna write out my other activities. Okay, so uh, like when I was in Denmark, I always went to a shooting drill next because they took a while to warm up. We started with shooting. I always do transition defense. So, I'll have, so let's say I do uh, army drill. Again, just remind me when we're on the court, I'll show you any of these drills. Uh, you know, then we're going to do post guard breakdown. And then I'll put uh, post is going to be a finishing series. And then guard is going to be strength shooting. And in time, I'll play one on one. Uh, and then we'll go three on three. And uh, I'll just put PNR, so I know I want to go over pick and roll, okay? I might put PNR O if I want to emphasize offense or defense if I want to emphasize defense. And then five on five. And that's what I write out. That's my practice plan. That's, that's pretty much what it looks like, okay? It's not very organized, okay? But what I want to be able to do is I don't want to put a specific time. Again, this is how I coach now, having done this for a long time. Okay, because if I see something in the army drill, or, or uh, more specifically in three on three or five on five, I want to have time to be able to go back. Okay, so uh, you know, let's say we're doing army drill, and let's say we're missing a ton of layups. Okay, we're just, just you know, we're getting good shots every time we're missing. All right, so I can always then go and before I go into my post guard. Okay, I'm going to add a layup here. Okay, and so within the practice, I'm going through my practice plan, I'm watching what's going on on the court, and then I'm adjusting. I'm saying, all right, this is ridiculous. Okay, let's get some concentration on what we're doing. Let's do a layup. Okay, just to kind of get our heads back into it, because there's no reason we should be missing this challenge. All right, uh, you know, I might watch our three on three and pick and roll. Okay, maybe I'm concentrating on defense, but I'm noticing that our offense, we're holding the ball too long. Okay, and so we're not taking advantage of, of the advantages that we create. Okay, so now, 
before I go to 5 on 5, I'm going to add in, and we're going to play another game of 3 on 3. On three. Uh, and I'm going to put the one second roll. Okay, so again, explain it when we get up there. All right, so basically, just three on three, except for every time you catch, you only have one second to do something. Uh, so that's why I don't put a time on my practice plan. Uh, I, I don't organize it minute by minute, because I've been doing it a long time, and I think one of my strengths is uh, adaptability and creativity. Um, and I will think on my feet. So I just have my general plan, and then I adjust as necessary within the course of the practice. All right? uh, the other thing I would say, and I have said, uh, to me the most important part of planning and practice isn't necessarily what you put on the paper or how it, you implement it during practice. It's the process of planning. So it's the time that you spend sitting down at your desk or and on your phone or on a piece of paper or however you're going to plan your practice. But that process of thinking about practice today, that's the most important part. Uh, and then whether you get into practice and you follow it or you don't follow it or you write out minute by minute or you don't or you adjust as you're doing things, to me those are much more secondary. But if you actually sit down and think about, all right, this is what I need to do and practice today. Oh yeah, Mary's not gonna be here, so I probably don't wanna do this. Uh, we have a game tomorrow, so I need to make sure that I go over this and this before the game tomorrow. Just that process of really thinking about practice as opposed to you know flying in from work straight to practice and go, oh crap. I got 12 kids in front of me, just, you know, all eyes on me, what am I going to do? Uh, go run some laps while I think about what we're going to do, you know? Uh, which is what I see, you know, when I, when I watch practice, you know? Stuff like that, or, you know? Uh, basically, the first 10 minutes, they just get away from me so I can think about what I'm going to do next, okay? Or you spend all your time setting up the next drill while you're ending the previous drill. Okay, which means you're not really concentrating as a coach on actually instructing skills. You're basically just setting up drills the whole time. Okay, so anyway, so I think I think the actual process of thinking is as important or more important than anything else related to planning and practice. And so how you do it, how you use it, whether you stick to it, you know, adamantly. I mean, there are very good coaches who refuse to deviate from their plan. If they say that they're going to play five on five for 10 minutes, they are putting 10 minutes on the clock, the horn goes off for 10 minutes, and then they're going to the next activity. It doesn't matter what happened in that game, it doesn't matter where they were in the game, anything. 10 minutes on the clock, when the 10 minutes end, they're doing whatever's next on their list. And there are great coaches that do it that way. Okay? That's just not me. That's not how I coach, that's not how I'm comfortable, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm basically trying to show you two different ways. Pick what works for you. Um, and then, you know, as you get more experience, maybe you change, maybe you like the way you do. Like I said, I, I did it the old way. Probably the first four or five years that I coached, I only started doing it this way over the last five, eight years. Something like that. All right, so it just depends on, on what you want to do. Yeah. All right, so there's two things, the whole reason for using the uh, blackboard today. Two things I want to draw, kind of start to explain, and then we can uh, eat. All right. Part of this is going into practice design. Okay, but that's okay. When you're thinking about drills, okay, most people will think of simple, easy, hard. Uh, complex, all kind of as the same thing. Okay, so what I want you to think about is there are two different scales. Okay, so you have a scale from uh, easy, okay, so from easy to hard, and uh, simple.
right? So, when you think about a skill or a drill or whatever, easy to hard, okay, pertains to the individual. All right? So we could do the same drill, and it could be easy for me and hard for you, or vice versa. Okay? It has nothing to do with that drill. Okay? It simply has to do with, more or less, uh, the player's skill level. Okay, so within a team, okay, you're going to have varying levels of abilities. Okay, so you might give them a drill. All right, so to take something easy, let's say dribbling two balls, same time. Okay, if you have a pure beginner, that's going to be very hard. If you have a player who's played several years, it's really not a hard drill. Okay, to, to just dribble two balls at the same time. Okay, it's not very hard. Okay, but if you've never done it before, it seems like it's a very hard thing to do. Okay? But it's purely individual. The task is the same for both players. Okay? But how they perceive the task is different. Okay? So that is easy to hard. Okay? Simple to complex is based on the task. Okay? And so to get uh, kind of geeky science on you, all right, there are actual ways to determine whether something is simple or complex. Okay? So, one is whether or not you're moving. Okay, so anything that's stationary is simpler than something with movement. Anything when you're manipulating a ball or an object will be more complex than something when you're not manipulating something around. Okay, uh, if every repetition is the same, that will be simple compared to if every repetition uh, is different. All right. And if the environment is always the same, that's simple. If the environment is constantly changing, that's complex. Okay? So to explain that in real terms, all right? Pretty much everything in basketball is going to be not in the most simple category because everything involves a ball. More or less. Every most skills that you're teaching, most drills that you're doing involve a ball. Okay? So so almost everything has manipulating a basketball. Alright? If I do a stationary dribbling drill where whatever drill you want to do, as, as hard or complicated as you want to make the drill, okay? But if I'm stationary and it's a drill where I'm doing the same thing over and over, so let's say uh, we'll use the same drill. So two ball drill, stationary two ball drill. That is a very simple drill, okay? I have, I have ball manipulation, okay? So it doesn't fit the, in the most simple category, okay? But I have no movement. Every trial or every repetition is the same, and there's no environmental changes. Okay, I'm standing in the same spot. Okay, nothing out there is affecting my ability to dribble. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, dribbling in a game. Now, dribbling in a game might be easy. Okay, especially if there's no pressure, etc. Okay. But if I dribble in the game, one, I have movement. Okay. If you're dribbling, standing still, you're just wasting time. Okay. But so I have movement, so right there it's more complex. Okay? Every trial or every repetition when I dribble is going to be different. Okay? There's a saying by, I have his name in my backpack, Eulicutus, I don't know, some old Greek or Roman guy. Okay? It said, whenever, you never step in the same river twice because the river is never the same and the man is never the same. Okay? So in a game, when you're dribbling, it's never the same, all right? So uh, every time you bounce the ball, let's say I'm moving forward, every time I bounce the ball, the situation is changing. Okay, I'm one step closer to a defensive player, okay? Uh, maybe a defensive player behind me is one step closer to stealing the ball, okay? Or maybe somebody's on my right, maybe somebody's on my left, maybe a teammate's open, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it's constantly changing, and the environment is constantly changing because as I'm dribbling in a game, there's nine other people who are probably moving, okay, trying to get open, trying to play defense, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So dribbling in a game is basically as complex as you can get. Okay, now again, it can be very easy. You watch somebody like Chris Paul dribble in a basketball game, and he makes it look very easy, okay, regardless of what the defense is doing, okay, but it's still a complex skill, all right? So simple to complex is based solely on the task Whereas easy to hard is based solely on the end. Okay? 
Okay, so you can have a simple hard drill, you can have an easy complex drill. Okay, you can have a hard complex drill. Alright, does that make sense? Okay, now, what this means is, there are, when you're designing drills, okay, so, to improve, you constantly need to overload your skill. Okay, does that make sense? So, imagine you're in the weight room, and you want to get stronger, you don't lift the same weight every single day. Right? You need to add weight to continue to get stronger. Okay, we understand that in a physiological sense. Okay, so in a learning sense, okay, you need to constantly overload your skill as well. So if I can dribble one ball stationary, okay, maybe I want to practice with two balls, or maybe I want to practice moving forward, or maybe I want to run, or maybe I want to change directions, or maybe I want to change hands with the ball. Okay? All that is starting to overload the skill. Okay, so when I start out, okay, I can't do it, then I learn, I can do it. So then I do something else, I do something else, I do something else. Okay? The second part of that, okay, is to improve a skill, it needs to be specific. Okay, so the more specific the task is to the ultimate goal, the more they will be transferred. Okay? So, there are a lot of drills that you can find on YouTube. Okay, on how to improve your dribbling ability. They include all sorts of different things. Okay? For the most part, when you do these drills, so my favorite, dribbling a ball, let's say doing crossovers and picking cones off the ground. Okay? When you do that drill, you are getting better at doing that drill. You're not necessarily getting better at doing a more complex task. So even though standing here dribbling a basketball and picking up cones looks complex, it's not. I'm stationary, every child is the same, and there's nothing in the environment that's changing. Okay? So it's a simple drill. It might be hard. I've never tried. It looks hard. It looks cool on, on YouTube. Okay? So it might be very hard to do. All right? But it is not specific to a game. Because at no point in a game do you dribble around and pick up cones. Not only that, Besides the fact that it's not something you do in a game, it's also directing your attention inappropriately. So never in a game do you want to look at the ground, which is where the cone is. Okay? Never in a game, if I'm picking a cone off the ground, my posture is going to be different than it is when I'm dribbling in a game. Even though we tell players to get low when they dribble, nobody actually dribbles in a game like this. It's not practical. You can't move very quickly. Okay? It just doesn't happen. All right. There are reasons to practice like that occasionally, or when you're beginning to teach specific things. Okay, but nobody does that in a game. So now I'm practicing with a posture that I'm not going to use. Okay. So to transfer uh, my skills from practice to a game, all right, I want to think more about how I can make this uh, drill or skill more complex, and less about whether I can make it harder. Does that make sense? So if, I, if I'm a good, if I have a competent ball handler, okay, I can do all the moves, et cetera, et cetera, and I want to overload his or her skill, rather than giving them two balls to use, or picking up cones, or throwing tennis balls, or any of these other hard things that you can do, I want to make it more complex. So maybe I'll play one on two. Okay, so they ask to dribble against two defensive players instead of just one. Okay, or maybe I'll just put one defensive player if we haven't even gotten to that point yet. So playing one-on-one -on -one is more complex than just dribbling in a straight line. Does that make sense? There's no defense player. Okay? So the way that I want to advance skills and enhance the transfer to games, I want to think more about going from simple to complex and less about easy to hard. Most coaches ignore this and focus simply on this. Okay? And if they do get this, they get it kind of by accident. Okay, but they're really focusing how can I make it harder? I need to make it harder, I need to make it harder, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to make them run faster, okay? But I'm not adding a defense player. I just want them to go faster, okay? Or I'm going to add something, you know, they're going to have to juggle basketballs or whatever, okay? So they're concentrating on hard, but they're not concentrating on complex, okay? Basketball game, games are a complex environment. If you're practicing in simple environments and they're not absolute beginners, then you're not preparing them for a game. Okay, and there are times 
Even with advanced players, there are times to do simple drills. Okay, uh, not very often. Okay, but it doesn't mean it's wrong to do a simple drill. Okay, or to focus on doing something hard. Okay, because these kinds of drills can be very motivating for players. Right. So picking up cones off the ground, something they can't do, and then they practice it. You know, for a couple weeks, and now they can do it. They they can see their improvement. They can do something cool. They can show off to their friends. Okay, that's very motivating. Okay, and it can keep them interested, and, and it can keep them having fun. And so there are reasons why you may choose to go along this uh, continuum right here. Okay, but in terms of improving game skills, most of the time you want to look at drills or skills to figure out how you can uh, make them more complex. Okay, to continue to overload their skill, uh, to continue that ad adaptation and improvement. Okay, and then one last thing on this, and then we'll get lunch. So, Daniel Coyle, author of uh, The Talent Code, described three different kinds of practice. So you have crash zone, uh, sweet spot, and uh, comfort zone. Alright, so we always tell players you need to practice outside your comfort zone, you need to practice outside your comfort zone. That's what this is talking about. So, crash zone, uh, according to Coyle, uh, I think it's you succeed basically less than 50% of the time. Uh, Sweet spot is about 60 to 80 percent. Also, basically, if you're into the science, it's um, uh, Nagat or Nagatsky's uh, pro zone of proximal development, and then comfort zone is basically pain points. Okay, so comfort zone you rarely ever make a mistake. Sweet spot you make some mistakes, but it's kind of around right at the edge of your kind of ability. Crash zone you're making a ton of mistakes, probably when you're just beginning a skill. All right. So, again, let's take a pure beginner. Okay, comes out to practice. First thing, you know, starts bouncing the ball. Okay, can't really do it that well. You know, again, it's an easy and a simple drill. Okay, so it doesn't take very long to learn to learn how to bounce the ball. Okay, so they start here in the thrash zone. Okay, within minutes, they're already to their sweet spot. Okay, within minutes. They're already in their comfort zone. They can stand here and dribble, and they don't mess up. You know, they just dribble, 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 and they're fine. Okay? So, now as a coach, you've gotten them to their comfort zone for this skill, so now you have to add something. Okay? You have to overload the skill. How are you going to overload? Okay, now we're going to have them walk forward. Okay? So once they start to walk forward, now they're right back here. Okay? Because now they're bouncing the ball off their foot. You know, or they're changing their posture, they're staring at the ball as they're walking, they're taking little baby steps, making lots of mistakes. Okay? Again, it's slightly more complex, but it's still very easy. Okay? So they're quickly going to get to the sweet spot. Okay? And then very quickly get back to the comfort zone. Alright? So once they get back here where they're not making mistakes, now you have to add something else. You have to overload their skill. Alright? So what are you going to do? Now you ask them to run. Okay? So now they start to make more mistakes. Now they're back here. Okay? Then, you know, again, not very complicated, not very complex. So they're going to improve pretty quickly. So now they're back to their comfort zone. Yes? So what's the percentage again? Like it's um, the so trash zone? Uh, this is under 50%. Or or, uh, the market of error? Less than 50%. Okay. okay. This is roughly 60 to 80% success. And this is 80 plus, 90 plus. Okay? Uh, Percentages are less important than the idea. Uh, so anyway, so all right. So now we can run with the dribble back to our comfort zone. So now what do you do? You have to add something else. Okay. Now you make them change directions, or uh, maybe you have them go against the defensive player. Okay. Or you start to work on a crossover move. You know, whatever. There's you can do it many different ways. Okay. From that. That's it. But the overall point is. Uh, yeah, that I came up with. So learning spirals. Okay? So most people think of 
learning as so constant improvement. Okay, so this being uh, let's say this is time and skill. So the more time that I put into it. <coughs> The more my skill improves. All right, I guess small is a chunk. Uh, okay, so that's how, that's kind of the, uh, you know, linear developmental model, essentially. Right? Is the more you do something, the better you get. In reality, <coughs> excuse me, improvement, oh, sweet. Improvement is nonlinear. Okay? So just because you practice today doesn't mean you're going to be better tomorrow. Okay? Because if, if you practice something new, you might not improve. I mean, I, you know, I used a fairly easy drill, but, you know, let's say we're talking about, you know, how to use a pick and roll, okay? And we're working against a trap in a pick and roll situation, okay? You're not going to make this improvement, you know, in a matter of minutes, okay? You're not going to go from having never seen a trap in a pick and roll situation to, you know, acting like Steve Nash you know, in a matter of minutes, okay? It's going to take days, weeks, months, years for that improvement, okay? So instead of this line, it's going to be, okay, I can dribble, I can dribble. Oh, crap, now there's a defensive player. Oh, now I'm not very good, okay? Oh, now I can do it, okay. Oh, but now there's two defensive players. Now I'm getting better, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. Oh, but now I have to make a pass off the dribble, and so I'm not very good at that. And I have to make a pass against the defensive player. And so that's how development, eventually, you get to the same point, okay? But it's how you get there, okay? And so what's really going on is I start at a low point where I'm not very good. I improve that skill, okay? And then I have to restart it. Because if, if all I did was go from here to here, and then I stopped using my original example, that means all I'd be good at is standing still and dribbling. And if I continued to practice that over and over and over, I would master standing still and dribbling. <coughs> but I would not necessarily improve my ability to run with the basketball, to play against a defensive player, to change directions, all the other things that are going to cause me to loop back and make more mistakes. And the older you get, the better you get, you might not go all the way back. You might barely get out of your sweet spot. You know, because it's you know, harder to induce tons and tons of mistakes in a, you know, a, a very skilled high school player, okay? Because as the further you go along in improvement, you know, the less there is to improve, right? So you take a beginner, let's take shooting, you take a beginner, right? And they can't make a layup, okay? So you're starting with layups here. Right? You take a, you know, let's say an 18-year-old player, well, they can already make layups, they can make different kinds of layups, so, how are you going to get them out of their comfort zone, right? And try to get them back to the crash zone. You're trying to extend their range, or you're doing it with bigger defensive players, stuff like that. Okay? But they're still going to be able to handle most of those challenges. Okay? Because they already have well-developed skills. So it's harder to get them all the way back here. Okay? So they might just barely get out of their sweet spot and back here. Okay? But again, the point being, as a coach, Okay, and this, this happens on individual levels, not just team level. As you're trying to develop your skills or you know, coach skills, develop skills, transfer, uh, you know, learning to games, stuff like that. Okay, this is basically what you're doing. Okay, is you're taking a skill and then you constantly have to find ways to overload that skill. Okay, and as you're overloading that skill, again, once we get past kind of the beginner level or the first season of play, you want to spend most of your time overloading okay, by making the skill more complex, okay, and less time trying to make it important. Anybody have any questions before I get lunch? Just want to say a little later. I want to all of that. Well, I, I would have one question. Yes, sir. Um, You're allowed. So, to get to a point where you make these drills more, well, complex. Um, 
you do have to have some sort of an understanding of the game, whether it be basketball or soccer or whatever sport, to, to, to anticipate the situations that, that, that would call for the mastering of the skill. So some acquire that knowledge by playing, so playing at a high level. Um, if you haven't played at a high level, um, how do you do it? Um, is it watching a lot of games? How, what's the process of learning about the game so you can build those, those, those complex situations and, and, and figure that out without having your really teachers? Uh, yeah, well, there's two ways to answer that. Number one, yes. Uh, I'm watching games, watching practices, talking to other coaches, reading books, etc., etc., are all ways that you can enhance your learning. Uh, second way to answer it is there's only so many things you can do on a basketball court, right? So, and basketball is easier um, than soccer. Because soccer uh, is more complex because there's more people on the field. Okay, so there's more people that count for. So it's uh, in some ways it's easier to continue to add complexity in soccer because instead of basketball, there's really no reason to go beyond five on five. In soccer, you know, you can start out, you know, three on three and then four on four and six on six and eight on eight, nine on nine, and you're constantly continuing to add complexity to the situation. Uh, so that's the first first answer I'd say is, you know, there's only so much you can do on the court. And the further removed you get from situations, um, the less the transfer is going to be. Okay? And so you might be making things harder or more complex, but at some point it becomes kind of pointless as well, okay? So, uh, so there's essentially, to make something complex, okay, you're basically talking about uh, time and space, okay? So the more, the more time and space that you have to do whatever you're asking them to do, the simpler it is. The more that you take away that time and space, the more complex it's going to be. Okay? So whatever whatever skill you're working on, okay, or whether it's a team skill or an individual skill, if they're not as good, you want to make it more simple. So let's take passing as an example. Okay, so when I do passing drills and I start out with you know basically beginner type players, uh, most coaches make easy drills, right? You stand two players across from each other and we're going to stand here and we're going to throw the ball back and forth. Okay? That is both easy and simple. Okay? I want to try to make it more game-like. I want to try to uh, incorporate some of the constraints for a game. So instead of two people standing here, I might do like a four-on-two passing game. Okay? So different ways you can do it. Okay, but basically, in easy ways, you have offensive players, and so this offensive player can move from this cone to this cone. Okay, this one can move from this cone to this cone, here, 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 here. Okay, so they can all move, okay, but they're moving within a restricted area. Okay, so that's simplifying it as opposed to allowing them to run anywhere. Okay, I'm restricting their movement. Okay, and then I have two defensive players in here. All right? With four offensive players and two defensive players, okay, somebody's always open. Okay, so theoretically, if we do it well offensively, I should always have an open pass to make. Okay, because let's say the ball's here, they go to the ball. What's this player going to do? Okay, if, if they shade this way, well, this is a wide open pass. Okay, if they try to play back here and try to guess, well, Either one of these, especially if they come all the way to the line, that's an easy pass. Okay. Now, for a beginner, it's not easy, easy. It's not as easy as me standing here and throwing the ball back and forth. Okay, but it's fairly easy. Okay, I, but I'm maintaining some of the constraints of the game, right? So I have to read the defensive player. I have to avoid the defensive player on me, etc., etc. Okay. To make it more complex, then. I just reduce it. So now maybe we play three on two. Okay? So that's going to make it uh, more complex, but it's also going to make it harder for the offensive players because there's less space, uh, you know, for them to get open. Okay? Less options. Okay? Less of an advantage for the offensive team. All right? 
and then I could do a two on two drill, a wrench and pump, okay? So two on two is a more simple drill than doing a four on four, okay, or a five on five, okay? Because a two on two, unless you change the space. So if I use the entire half court, with four players, okay, there is lots of space to get over. If I do the same drill, but now I add and play five on five, okay, now there's less space. Okay, so that makes it more complex. Okay, does that make sense? All right. If I want to make it harder then, so let's say we're playing five on five and we've mastered it, well, I can reduce the space. Okay, and now it's going to be even more complex. Okay, because things are going to have to happen quicker. There's less space to get open. Okay, so whatever skill it is, uh, that's essentially how you want to look at it. So even if you're, uh, you know, not experienced with basketball, you've never played basketball. I never played basketball at a high level either. Okay, so but any skill, that's just how you want to think about it. How, and I'll talk about later or tomorrow or something. I'll, I'll go through how to do a shooting drill um, and take it basically from simple to complex. But uh, but that's essentially any skill that you want to do. If you think about it at its most basic, how do I give them the maximum possible time and space without getting too far from the game? And then as they improve, I incrementally move further and further and further until I'm basically at the game. And then, if it's a specific skill, okay, I might need to overload it even more and go beyond the game. Okay, so in this drill, five on five, if that's too easy and I want to take away time and space even more, I can put an extra defensive player there. Okay, because I'm working on a specific skill. Okay, it's somewhat less game like because you never face a situation in the game, but again, that's how you overload a skill. Okay, if, if, if they're competent and five on five becomes too easy, then I add another defensive player, and that overloads the skill, makes it more complex, it also makes it harder, okay, so that I can continue to improve their skill, okay, because I'm taking away time and I'm taking away space even more. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? It does. 